Nice glasses. Hey, thanks, man. Is uh, DC DCTH is moving right now? DCTH, yeah. SPGC. I'm finally back green on that ticker, but I'm down on the yeah. day. It's so frustrating. It's 83 right now. Seven dollars is high a day. Yeah, I've got an eye on that. When that <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm done for today. Once I log off, I'm I always, <laughs> I always feel a lot of anxiety when you guys are trading during the, <laughs> um, during the zooms. I'll do that. I, I watch, I watch Daddy trade, and I'm like, no, just, just stop. <laughs> and so, because I, I always stopped at, um, back when I used to like trade actively, like. I stopped at like ten thirty, like eleven. My stats just weren't good afterwards. So my stats are actually pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> and lately, I do find that after um, it's only worth it if you work for it. It's only worth it if you work for it. I won't stop till they hear me now. I won't stop till I wear the crown. After. It's about 11.30 Eastern is my cutoff, but um, through the history of my last couple of years of trading, pretty much most of the day is almost even. Just lately, I've been seeing that trend towards the first hour and a half of the day. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Most people Dif always... Yeah, have... exactly. Yeah. A little bit different than most people for some reason. We all have our edges and our, our time zones. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, if Danny's not in a trade right now, I guess uh, <laughs> I'll do a little introduction here for Lawrence because new yeah. to the podcast, uh, new to the insider group, and we want to learn a little bit about you. You're more of an algo trader, so it's going to be really interesting to hear different perspectives because we're all discretionary traders here, uh, but you've been in the game for a bit. Uh, I'll get, I'll do a quick background and then you, know, you take the floor because yeah, the less yeah. I talk, probably the better. Uh, you're living in the States now, really close to Colby. So in Philly, right? Yeah. It was Philly. Yeah. And, um, but you were from Nigeria. You have a Nigerian dad and a Malaysian mom. And uh, so you speak both the languages there. No, both of them are Nigerian. Both we of them are Nigerian. Ended, That's what it was. We just ended up in Malaysia. We, oh, and I then did. you ended up, okay. Yeah, Somehow like I wrote that down years. wrong. No, 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 it's fine. I Most people can confuse that too. Like a lot of people always like, Oh, did you grow up? Because also, like, I could tell, I could see people thinking maybe I look Malay because Malay, the skin tone is a little bit like, um, yeah, kind of like my skin tone. But my mom, my mom had like a lighter skin tone, and my my dad is as dark as like Toby's hair. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I grew up in Malaysia, and then um, and then this. I did high school there for like 13 years and then um, came over here to, yeah, go to college, computer science. And that was fun. Um, and that's kind of when I got into like training. Well, really well, closer to when I graduated. I have a question. Was this before or after this video right here where you're doing the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this was actually, um, I don't remember. Uh, this was... Was this my this was like my third year of college i think and um i yeah we we it was it was funny because i was like i wanted to grow my social media because i was working out so much and then i was like you know what um because i i literally had like 200 followers on instagram i barely used instagram but i was like i need to figure out how to do this because I, I was like i had the physique i was like okay i need to just figure out what would get me momentum and yeah, I used to hold it. I used to solve the Rubik's Cube one-handed. Uh, back in there, I had a national record for solving it. And um, That's and crazy. I was, oh, and this was actually the first video that started it off. I was working. If you see, I'm actually wearing my staff shirt. I was working. And <laughs> my boss saw this actually a couple of days later. And she was like, wait, what's going on? You shouldn't be doing this at work. Uh, <laughs> but it was funny because she actually thought it was pretty cool. And it ended up going you know, viral. It was on World Star, like, I have a connect at World Star, so if I ever want to post a video, I can always get it on there, <laughs> which is nice now. Um, but early on, it was um, it was really just a grind. I think every everyone on social media tries, you know, feels that it's a huge grind in the beginning, and after a while, you get like very comfortable. And then this is the one of the ones that went super viral. Uh, this is the one that like Will Smith has on his Instagram to this day. 
Um, yeah, that's just, crazy, yeah. huh? Yeah, um, you were telling me about when he posted that. It just yeah, yeah. It, it's funny because I have a friend named Will Smith. <laughs> and so I looked at my phone that day. I was like sitting, this is a while after I posted this too. I looked at my phone and it says Will Smith tagged you on a video. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, Will, why did Will tag me in a video? Uh, and silly I Will. Profile, I look at the profile picture and I was like, wait, that's that's not <laughs> that's Will. And then I immediately my notifications on everything just blew up. Um oh yeah, I forgot about this one. This one, um, I can't oh, remember. Wow, that's amazing. I think this one, this one almost actually almost got me um on the Ellen show. I was supposed to go on Ellen for this, and then it was right before their last season, so I wasn't I wasn't able to go. Um, but like I had I had talked to the team and everything for for a while. Um, but she she really liked it and she wanted me on, to kind of talk yeah, to I mean, me about. It. Yeah. Damn. So, <laughs> I, I okay. So you're now in the states. You're doing this, getting exposure. At what point do you go into trading, or like what's next? Oh. You you fill in the blanks. Well, I guess I never I I never really even knew that the markets existed. You know, people talk about stocks, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, I don't really care. And and then I think one day a, a friend was like, this was during the AMC thing, so I I came a little bit late. Um, it was like AMC push, I think yeah. Some, I think someone said like I don't know if it was AMC. Well, one of my friends had like a position in Zoom, and he was like, "Dude, this stock Zoom is doing well." He was like, "Oh, how, wait, what does it work?" And I was like, "Oh, you just put money, and if you win, you make money." And I was like, "Wait, that's how the stock market works." And so, and then I in my in my head, I never knew that that was an option of something to do because you know, uh, it, it never even even sounded like any form of gambling. It's it's just sounded like, oh, that's actually just you doing some research and you understanding, and then you know, winning. And then so from there, I, I think he, he helped me get the position in and I did well. And I was like, oh, okay, this works. And so then the grind just started, you know, watching all the YouTube videos, um, kind of, you know, watching, I think everyone always ends up with Ross because initially he like dominates the, the day trading algos, um, algorithm on YouTube. So they kind of push him out. And then from there, I just kept doing it. I think I grinded up starting with really small size, especially, you know, when you don't have that much money, you're just figuring it out. It was right, it was right after I graduated. Um, and it was fun because I was already like, okay, well, this just seems like what I'm going to do no matter what. Because I've always been like, I need to be independent. You need to be able to figure it out yourself so that you don't depend on anyone. Um, and yeah, so while I was just, while I was working or trying to get a job, I was still doing it on the side like everyone else. Um, day in and day out you know grinding trying to figure out how to be profitable and at some at points I was I was profitable and I think what it is was it's just for me personally it was just I you know sitting in front of a computer I remember I told Alex this I was like in a meeting and I had I was in a meeting trading I was like um what's I I just I started to be like what's going on this is just ridiculous like I can't be because I, I at that point I was losing a little bit and I was just like why am I I should just focus on the meeting because like this is important and so and then I was just like I think that's when I, I ran into like critical trading I had watched him before and I've watched docs and a lot of other people who are more statistical at their approach but I wanted to just get figure out how to do it I was like you know what you know a couple months of my life to figure this out will save me a lot of headache which you know I'm, I'm I'm going to be honest, it does, like, I don't really have headache of, oh, if I lose, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen or, oh, I'm in a huge drawdown. Am I going to be able to come out of it? Because um, when you see how the statistics, you see how the, the charts work, you start to be like, it's just like, oh, it's it's, it's going to work itself out in, in a month. Like, there's never going to be a quarter that I'm not profitable um, unless, you know, something ridiculous happens. And even then, I, I'm not going to lose my account because uh, we have, like, um we have thresholds and everything so so yeah that's pretty much it so right now i mean if you want to know the in in and outs you'd have to be specific with your questions but pretty much you know my day-to-day -day is just um managing all the strategies we have and when i get to it and so just you, making sure they execute making sure they execute and then coming up with new strategies i think coming up with new strategies is like the hardest part of the game but i don't really care about the trades themselves um, yeah so that's really interesting because we're all uh uh, discretionary traders more or less, right? We're all trading ourselves and you were discretionary trader for like a year and then you switched to coding yeah. your own algos. 
So I, I did. I went to school for computer science, and right. it does help. I was gonna. I was gonna right. ask that. But no, no, no. But I was gonna say, you know, the platform that I code in, I truly do believe. Like, if you don't, if you don't code that, if you don't code ever, you can get into it. Because even my brother doesn't code in what I'm coding in, because it's it's still it's hard to grasp a little bit of how the guy structured it. It's called Ami Broker, um, but it does work like some form of C. But it's very, very basic, and the functions are, are its own. It's not like a Python where you have to learn all the functions because the the platform is built in for stock trading. So it's literally built for you to be able to just develop strategies. Um, so um, it took me eight months, probably six six months to learn. Um, and then really the last three, four months to really start developing strategies that were somewhat viable. Like even some of the strategies I have right now, I'm like, this is still working? Okay, all right, it's, it's still working. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna turn it off yet because it's working. But it, it does, it, it now I have more of a systematic approach to creating like robustness testing. So like if I come up with a strategy and it goes live, I know it's gonna be profitable or perform at least decently, like for me to not worry about what the outcome is. And when you have multiple strategies in a portfolio, you really don't worry. Like I told you, you know, there are people who have 500 to a thousand strategies um, that in algos that, you know, they just essentially just print money. They don't really, you know, you know, they manage their, their risk, but to some extent. Yeah. So this is really different than discretionary trading because typically we'll have one strategy and try to get really good at it. And then maybe within a few years, you add a second or third yeah, one. Or like two or three. Yeah. Yeah. And for you, you're basically saying you want as many as possible because ideally when the market's doing crazy stuff, you have a few that correlate, some that don't correlate. And then yeah. the ones that are not working kind of stop themselves out and the other ones ride. In a nutshell. Yeah, and I, I I agree. I think like we've talked about this. I said discretionary traders can be better than algos, but you have to be very niche and very focused, right? I think it's very mm -hmm. interesting to see people like Relentless who are constantly profitable. Um, I always say they're high frequency, they're high frequency, low float traders. Essentially, when you're the people who make the most money, the, peop the, the people who make the most consistent money are the high frequency uh, firms. Because what they do is, it's funny because I was, it's funny, I matched with a girl on Tinder and we were talking, like our conversation was just, she worked at, uh, she worked at, um, hang, what's, uh, not as, like Goldman uh, Sachs or something? She worked at, no, Citadel. So she was a high, she was a data. <laughs> That's the perfect <laughs> place to learn. That means you're a high frequency floor. So oh, me God. and her were discussing, talking about that the whole time. But it's like those people, they make the most money because they, they, they work with the market, with the, the flow of orders, right? So yeah. if you know, or if you can understand what volume looks like, what volume direction looks like, you can honestly just predict, have a stronger prediction of where it's going to go. So that's why I say people like, like, like someone would see Relentless or, you know, Mighty Stocks and all these crispy trades with all of those guys and be like, how are they so profitable at day in and day out? Green days, two red days out of the year. But if you understand their trading style fits um, a style of trading that has very high probability of winning so on a consistent basis because they are playing pennies. They are, you know, versus if you're holding for a longer degree of time, in which a lot of my algos are not, none of my algos really are very high frequency. Most of them hold for like, can anywhere from like five minutes to an hour, right? Which to, for you guys could be too long. Like, especially for like, like Tommy. Tommy's probably, that's like too long. <laughs> I know, I've seen how he, I've seen some of your your live trading, and that's that's how I used to trade. The reason why I say that is because I used to trade the same way. I used to I used to be a, a Call of Duty competitive Call of Duty player too. So I'm very I have really <laughs> strong reaction speed. I used to like best of the like some of the best in Malaysia. Well, actually, the best in Malaysia was my team. Like they ended up going to the Asian Championship and winning. Um, Were you more of a I, sniper or an assault rifle? <laughs> no, I was a I was a I was a nice. Uh, <laughs> Count the night. I, I was a slayer. I was like the I was like the guy who runs around and kills people for the team. That was like yeah. I, I, I had high focus, high adrenaline. I think it, it kind of fit my my personality. Making type. of a day trader. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I day Honestly, trade, I feel like this is just me play card. I'm like, this is real. some of the uh, some of the best guys in our community were like high level StarCraft players, like basically just strong hockey skills. Yep, I said your hotkey is still strong reaction. I said in time. one of your comments, I had like twenty hotkeys for Weeble, and they were all used. And I just remembered what every like different offsets depending on the slippage. But like, yeah, 
yeah like stuff like that i think it really lends itself to being a good i i, I say to this to myself like had a, if i had a kid i'd probably just teach them how to play stock like it's a video game because yeah it's, it really is it really it, can uh, no, it makes me think this, in your early teens that'd be great or even like in your 10 years old yeah. you'd be crushing it it makes me think of like how i ended up trading and and uh how I got here. I have a degree in biology, but I used to play RuneScape all the time. And I used Best. to flip. Yeah. O OG video games. Um, I used to flip, flip stuff, buy lower, sell higher. And um, it was really fun for me. And it makes total sense now that I'm just doing that exact same thing with stocks now. Um, and what you were saying about the high level of consistency and in, in being kind of like a scalp trader, what is really interesting as I have really leaned heavily into that style of trading this year more than any and with more size than I have before is I've noticed my accuracy has plummeted down to like 48, even 50%. But my green versus red days, I'm green 89% of the time day wise, which is yeah. I think mainly because I'm taking a position usually off of a low. My risk is like my it's it's interesting how i define my risk at that point because whether i'm taking a trade off of a level or anything like that the way that i trade i'm only ever going to let something go against me maybe five cents but i'm taking a position in a place where i think that i have 10 yeah, 20 the, 30 right. cents and so yeah, and i'll so, take that loss so, so my accuracy at, is low but if you look yeah. at most stocks, like when they reach a certain point, like look at a stock, uh, a large cap stock and look at when it, what happens when it goes to like 120 moving average. Notice yeah. that it doesn't it need to respect that, but it reacts to it. So there are, there are high frequency um, algos that definitely take advantage of those, those, um, those climax, those climactic moments, and then make them, they, they make their move, they make their money and they're done. Whereas you know, bigger, longer hold time traders, people who don't have really people just who don't have the infrastructure. It's really actually just infrastructure. The thing about being a human is and a discretionary trader is that you can, you know, I remember when I used to play Call of Duty, put me in a map. I know where people are and I know what's happening on their side before. Like I can assume where they're running or where people are on the map. If I'm playing search and destroy just off feel and sound. Like I'm just like tell I can tell that people are here. And it, it's it's kind of expected for everyone who used to play card. It's like, dude, how are you a pro player and you're not aware of like what's happening in doing yeah. the SND map? So it's Grenade. the same thing with with trading. I feel like if you're not aware of what volume looks like or what the tape is looking like when you're reacting to things, you're not gonna be so I'm saying I, I guess what I'm saying is that being that good scalper is a really is a skill that kind of grows on to you versus something that you can just walk into and do well versus there are, there are people who I, I know who just come into the market and do some basic technical analysis and still are profitable but they hold longer and they don't really care about what volume looks like over you know that I think holding longer is so difficult when you come to the trading world because investing yeah. is just a whole different cookie and there's so many variables like I have a success ratio of like a win ratio of roughly 67%, but my risk reward is like one to one, actually slightly negative. So it's, it's fairly predictable on the short term, but I feel like the second you start branching out, even like 10 minutes, it's like, it becomes a whole different cookie. Yeah. I think um, for me, what I, I, you know, I can show you guys like is, if, you know, I, I, I told, I told you this, Alex, pretty much anything works right in a market. It's really yeah. how you structure your anything, right? Oh, uh, that's why. <laughs> what did you say? DCTA just broke seven finally. <laughs> Is everyone still trading that? I just oh, made four hundred. <laughs> yeah, wow. nice. Are you green on the day then? I'm green. I'm green, baby. <laughs> Good for you, man. Good for you. That was a nice pop, but. Dude, I'm that's I'm crazy. done on trading for today. That's for sure. That's funny. Well, one day I will. I, I'll probably have to pick you guys' mind because, well, like if we ever do a, well, I mean, I'm thinking of coming into the small cap markets again, and, and it's, I, but I I feel weird because I forgot what my my daily routine looked like, <laughs> like my morning routine. I I forgot that. Like, yeah, I'd have to wait. You know, 
see if there's anything over 20 percent volume blah blah blah. Um, yeah you definitely anyways, need a bit of a routine a bit of a like a journal yeah, schedule yeah. and it's and i think that's it. the thing one of the reasons why i walked away from it was it, it is it is somewhat of a lot uh but after you get to you know you become consistent and profitable it's not as bad but you do have to be very, you know, cognizant of market conditions. Uh, actually, that's a good question for you guys. Like, what is your, what is your your gauge of market condition, besides you know looking at a bunch of scans? Uh, do you like break through? Do you go through a bunch of charts every other day, or just like wake up and you you already can feel it? Mine is volume. <clears throat> like volume. the last the last two weeks, pretty much coming into the open. You could just tell it's going to be a boring day. There's no volume on anything. There's no interest. There's no range. Anything that pops up pre-market gets smacked all the way back down. That's pretty much how I gauge what's going on in the morning, at least. And then um, lately, especially summer months, traditionally slower to begin with. But um, like if that's happening in the morning, you can kind of count on um, not much else is going to be happening the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely yeah. agree with that. And I'll even take it one, add one thing to it is uh, like, usually I don't like trading holidays. I even have this kind of rule that I usually take. If it's a three-day weekend, I'll make it a four-day weekend. And those that's been working really well for me. And today, or yeah, today is a European bank holiday and yesterday is probably a bit of a bridge day. And you could have, you just felt the lack of volume again. I mean, it's probably not a significant amount of traders maybe in the EU, or maybe it is, but you know, anytime there's like a macro thing that just brings down volume like that, there's so much less follow through. And Monday was such a nasty day. I had one of, I had a max loss day, and I've had, I haven't had one of those in quite a while. And it was just like nothing I did worked. It was really frustrating. Uh, today was a little bit, I don't know if it was better or worse. I traded a little bit better, but uh, slightly red on the day after being green. So that's kind of annoying. But yeah, uh, just, you know, I think macros are pretty important. I don't like, I, I do read the news every day uh, for at least 15 minutes, just trying to get some of the bigger headlines. I make sure I know if there's any macros dropping like CPA, uh, I mean, CPI. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't want CPI to come out in the middle of one of my trades. That would be pretty bad um, usually. So just a general awareness. But I think for what we're doing, you don't really need to know a lot of fundamentals specifically on the tickers you're trading. So if there's a ticker and it's over VWAP and it's trending higher and there's good volume and it has a catalyst, you don't even have to read it. Like you could probably bet it's worth trading uh, for at least yeah. 30 minutes. Right now in the summer, you might get one or two trades on at max, but on a normal Q4, Q1 kind of conditions, it's that's pretty much all you need. Yeah, I can see that. Um, what about what about Tommy? I actually want to know because he does a little bit more of the high frequency type type of trading, which I'm, I'm sure Danny does, but I, I don't think I've ever seen like a video of Danny trading though. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely I'm on the fast, uh, faster yeah. end of the of the trading. Um, I definitely reflect a lot of um, Relentless Trader and how he uh, how he trades. Uh, you know, very quick one entry, one exit, maybe one ad. Um, and then the way to size up is maybe more so that starter position, increasing the starter position rather than scaling um, from like 100 shares and then scaling up in one position to like 1,000 shares or 2,000 mm -hmm. shares. Um, rather having that starter position of 1,000 shares to start with and then maybe add once. That's kind of what I'm working on um, rather than, you know, the slow scaling. Uh, but th the way that I find out momentum on the day is definitely 100% the scan is probably the number one thing I look at. However, I have to have context and the context I get is from the previous two or three trading days. If we're getting something like every day, like one stock that rips like 200% after the market open, um, then that's definitely my cue to be a little bit more aggressive on that day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is that is true because I, I actually used to do the same thing back when I was trade. I would I would if yeah, I could tell we're in a harder market, if, you know, if something went up two thousand percent yesterday and I'm like, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna come in a little bit. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. The really hard That's probably thing about my, that. my hard second <clears throat> is looking at that recent history. Gotcha. 
I was just going to say the really hard thing about that is that lately we've been having those types of moves that have absolutely no effect on momentum continuation. Like yeah. we had SNMP, we had VTGN, we had um, TSAT. They yeah. all went like a thousand percent and then nothing else followed. And it didn't really have any impact on um, like shorts confidence. I saw I saw people take like fifteen thousand plus dollar losses shorting those stocks, and then right back to it. You know, the next thing that pops up just gets smacked right back down. It's been, and that's the hardest yeah. part lately. So markets, that's one. That's another thing about like market cycles, especially you yeah. know the evolution of market cycles. It's, it's it's a very hard thing to deal with, and it actually brings me back to to my next question because I always wonder what you guys think. I have to deal with now doing like an algo. What what do you think and my like an algo looks like and the difficulty? Because I, I will be honest with you, it is very, you know, someone I remember watching a video, a guy called an alert his algo, like an alert for the price is breaking a new high. And I was like, I guess technically you could say that because it signals you to when to take a trade. But there's there's different complexities. So like whenever I say like, you know, I have an algo of multiple strategies. What does that, th does that sound super complex or does that sound like, oh, maybe he's just buying the next high that breaks uh, the new daily. I'm just curious on what your thought processes are on that. Anyone can answer that. That's like a free. I've already have a bit of the answer. So I'll let you guys, <laughs> you guys take the floor. You're asking like um, what is your perspective of yeah. algo trading? I mean, it's, as far as my knowledge and my perspective, they're, they're programs that buy and sell based on, tar uh, not targets, um, triggers based on triggers and they're, they're man-made. So they can still fall victim to emotion. I mean, not necessarily emotion, but some of the same pitfalls that just regular discretionary traders have. Um, <laughs> just because you have an algo doesn't mean it's you're like on the winning team side you can still have an algo that um is not profitable even so there's i know there's a lot of fine tuning involved and um i know some other guys who have tried to build their own algos and uh eventually discovered that the 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 pain or the time putting into it just wasn't worth it and these are for some people who are already making thousands or like their normal green day is one to five thousand dollars and they found that that was just the better way for them to keep trading yeah no i i completely agree with everything you said i think you know i've found because I've, I've also asked myself like you know why do a lot of really good traders not um have like some form of algorithmic ag yeah. algo associated with them and I, I think my biggest the thing is that most people try to come in first off making an algo is not as simple as you think this thing works because it does this. There's a lot yeah. of robustness testing that you have to go through. But honestly, yeah. actually, once you've figured out how to do the robustness testing, it now is effortless because anything that passes it, passes the robustness testing, you know, it's probably going to be, you know, it's probably going to work. Um, but I do, I do see your point of view, like everyone, the people trying to make it, I think I, I am, I do, I am curious though, when um, like someone like, um, like you guys, when you break your rule, right? Because me and Alex were talking about this. I said, if I ever came back to discretion little trading, I would just have my, instead of an algo, I'll just have my, uh, I'll have a program that triggers whenever a rule is broken based on my broker. Like I can read all the data from the broker. I can just trigger, like for example, if Tommy traded past 1030, his algo would do something will would turn off his broker right away and just not let him trade. I'm like, still on the I've trade. Said, oh, you break, you break your max loss. Boom, it cuts you out of the trade. Boom. So you don't even have to think about it. You're literally playing a game now until your your rule is broken. And I always think, why doesn't everyone at least have, just get a developer to just do that for you. If you have the money, because we were talking about Maz, uh, Mad As, um, which I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's like yeah. down 1 million on a year. And then he, in two days, a couple weeks ago, he he gave back all the money he made for the year, like 250k yeah. in two days. Yeah, all that. And um, and so it's I was like, I was telling Alex, like, a risk manager is cheap. <laughs> 200, like you can find yeah. someone who 
do that, who can manage that for you. But unless, you know where Ross has his broker, right? That like shuts Yeah, like he has his broker that, that stops him at like 6K now, whatever he, he sets it to. And I, I just find it interesting that discretional traders, because I think, um, who's that guy, San, San, Luci, San Luci or whatever? I remember yeah. listening to a, a podcast from him when he first moved to Puerto Rico and he said, you know, he sees the future of trading as traders working with computers. Not necessarily computers trading, because I will be honest with you, uh, even though, you know, you say you're not, algos are not necessarily sure they're on the winning side. 80% of the volume in the markets are algos, because most of the time they are the winning side. Because what happens is you're not playing, you're now playing a game of probability. You're not playing a game of, of do I feel, did I, was I sick today? Did my, you know, did, do I feel bad today? Or like Ross, it's my birthday, so I feel like I have to make, this much and i lose you know all of that you know there's no there's no sense so the don't trade on your birthday <laughs> yeah so the winning side is relative but i will i will give probability um an edge always because it's the same thing that happens when you be you you know you go into a casino you have they know they are on the probability probable edge and they that's why they are they're going to win no matter what so so I, I yeah i do i am curious on like um what you what your thoughts are on the whole idea of of traders discretional traders not having or not attempting especially when they're successful to put really strong safeguards for situations so they don't end up like mad, mad as and you know two days lose lose everything in for the whole year i would say yeah uh, is uh access part of it is just access to having that my broker think think or swim doesn't have um an ability just to cut you off at like minus a thousand or minus 500, whatever your max loss is. Um, otherwise I probably would be using it. And also there's some situations where it's okay to break your rules. Like let's say past 10 30, you know, some, like some days in like 2020, 2021, you want to trade the entire day. You don't want to stop at 10 30. So there's going to be some situations where you want to break your rules. Um, and then also, you know, just having access to, to enforcing that with a code is limited right now. Um, and I'm not sure if it would be worth putting in that time or that money to develop that, especially with somebody like me, I don't have any coding experience. I could easily learn, I'm sure over some time. Um, but I don't think as of right now, something I'd be willing to get into. Yeah, um, I, I think my question say, wasn't necessarily, yeah. my question wasn't necessarily also on, you know, like burgeoning traders. I guess what it was it was more like traders that are more established. Like, what do you what are your thoughts on why? Which, which is true. Access is one of them, but I I do think a, like from seeing Mars sometimes I think it's like a weird pride thing because yeah. a lot of people do say like he he should have a risk manager, and I feel like he just um, snubs it off. Like, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I can do this. I've been doing this for ten years. You know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you can always. Yeah, absolutely. Them. For yeah. for a quarter of a million dollars, I think you can hire somebody who can develop that for you for probably a quarter of that price or an eighth of that price that you would lose for a quarter of a million. But um, I guess they each is their own. And then also, I was going to say, like, even though there's a lot of like 80 percent of the volume is algos, um, algos and bots, they still create a pattern in the market that discretionary traders can identify and ride. Um, even though that'll still be the discretionary traders will still only be that statistic of 20%. So even though, you know, having those, the alco volume, I get still create like patterns on the tape, you know, volume patterns, uh, candlestick patterns, all of which we can learn. And also like in the, just the name itself, discretionary trader, I think people like the freedom to do whatever they want to do. I mean, that's why we kind of do this um as a career but uh yeah i mean i think the one hard rule i have is my max loss on the day mm -hmm. like that is just something i don't go over because i know you know if you once you get on tilt you can justify anything <laughs> and like i i i get pretty strict with walking away that i know we were talking about on i think it was friday you know like why I size down, you were saying like technically you should be you know sizing up or at least maintaining your size and actually Friday, I, I didn't size down like I usually do. And it kind of dug my hole faster. And a big reason I do size down, I was thinking about it is just to like, 
make sure that my mind and my trading is trending green before I start sizing more and more and more, because then you dig the hole faster and faster and faster. So really, I know that if I just had normal size and that next green trade could put me green on the day, it's more of a risk management tactic to keep reducing my size if I'm already in on a downtrend to mitigate the downside. And if yeah, I'm on a green I, trend, I want to keep sizing because I'm clearly doing something right. I agree with that. I, I, I think when I told you that, what I meant is that to get out of that hole, yeah, what I found is that when you do size down, what happens is that you stay in that hole longer, but you do yeah. reduce the drawdown. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a, so, you know, because I spent like two months trying to going through different tests of sizing across my equity charts. And I started to, I, I, it is then a personal decision is, are you choosing to ride that drawdown longer and stay safe or, you know, potentially break out if you, if you size up where necessary. And I will tell you, you know, because of the, I told you, I figured out the sizing thing. It's once you figure out where to size, then you can, you, that is not really an issue anymore because yeah. um, also that's another thing I was going to say, uh, bring up is, you know, truly because sizing is one of the biggest issues. It's like, my that's opinion, deep. I'll say my opinion, and then I could get you know your guys' thoughts on this. But my opinion um has always and I mean this is how I this is how my I work a lot of my algos now is that they size based on the best condition. Um so you can think of your win rate as whatever it is, like you know, Danny says his is 50 whenever he's scalping, but like there's always gonna be one one of those situations where you know it's probably a 90. Like everything is giving you a 90. So that's when you size up. But some people, what that, that that's the difference though. That's sizing based on the trade. But when do you size on your account? Like what gives you the, like if you're sizing on a, so for example, let's say you, you use a thousand shares, right? And you, you sizing up on a trade is used using 3000 shares. Well, when do you go up to using 4,000 shares as your base and 8,000 as your, your, your next one like what what is your i have an idea for why i like when i would do this but i, I would like to know you guys' thoughts on like when do you say okay it's time to double my size on everything like this is where i'm gonna stay or do you do a gradual uh a gradual i used to do linear but now i'm focusing on kind of what you said if it's a 90 percent trade like you know those setups where you just feel in your gut this is it those i go really much more aggressive and lately that's been increasing my average Although there are those days where I'll trade on the train and then I'm trading with tiny size, which throws up my stats a little bit, but I, I don't worry about that uh, as much. But yeah, right now I'm sizing more per trade as opposed to, or as in like per good setup, as opposed to like across the board. That's that's for me. I, I think, yeah, that, that answers the question. And also I, I guess kind of what I was also curious about was the, when do you decide that you're like I know I don't know what Tommy Tommy what your average size is, but like when do you decide okay I'm no longer going to only be trading I'm no longer only be looking for a thousand bucks for um you know a day I'm going to be going for like three grand or four grand like if if that was you know once you reach no, when do you kind one. of make that decision to like this is me now I'm not I'm not looking back like what <laughs> because I I see you I I do see you size up I know lot, man and then you go back. A lot, so um, I'm just curious. <laughs> Dude, I've been battling that for like the past six months to a year. Mm -hmm. It always felt like that every time I would size up, I would take like a massive loss. And then just like, I'm just sizing back down just to pick up the pieces to get back to where I was. And then size up again and then happens again. Um, I would think... Um, <sighs> My sizing strategy right now is is when I'm green, I'm expecting to get more green, um, you know, right out of the open. If you have like a nice, good, you know, 10 cent trade or so on like a stock between one and ten dollars, you know, that's pretty decent. And then I look to just double that chair size and then double it again. Um, that's kind of my sizing strategy is like because like, I want to read my expected value. So if I'm getting green on the day early, then I want to you know, double that or triple that and, you know, continually size up. But, you know, recently also this market, you haven't had consistent opportunities every day. So I can't, you know, be too hard on myself because 
you know, my expected value on some of these days are just negative and there's nothing that you can really do about it um, unless you completely want to adopt a new strategy, a short strategy or tr- move to large caps. So, you know, with my strategy, you know, some days you'll you'll get a nice solid green day and then the next day, you know, you want to just push it even harder and then some the next day mm-hmm. sometimes it's just not as good. And so you don't really kind of get that that runway of confidence to really like boost your share size over a consecutive of like a nice month or two. So, you know, it's kind of both, you know, part of it's probably confidence issues. And then part of it is also like the market is not giving that consistent opportunity to know that you're getting the proper reward for the risk that you're taking on. Yeah, that's how I feel lately. It's like, it's not worth the risk. Like when you, when I was looking at the tickers at one point today, I was like, nothing feels worth it. And that's kind of how I feel a lot during the summer, you know? So I might just take a whole month off next year, I swear. <laughs> August. For August. Yeah, August um, is always like that. Always. <laughs> you know, maybe you get those three great tickers, but most most of the time it's it's stressful. Yeah. Here, here's a question for you, Lawrence. I guess, you know, what's the biggest challenge you face as an algo trader? Is it finding more strategies or is it also tweaking them to get the algo like to get the sizing right because i'm sure that makes a huge difference with the algo trade. no i keep my size is, is the same across all my strategies i went through okay. a two-month thing of figuring out sizing like for the for each size for each strategy like which one gets more um i said so this was what i was going to tell you guys is that i size based off the maximum drawdown of the each strategy yeah so i can um I can give you an example, but like if like, let's say once, so one of my strategies is really good, uh, but it has a really, it has a 10% drawdown potentially, like over its, over its five year uh, test. Like is that five. drawdown on the account or like it's allocated? On the account, account, on the account. On, no, just on, on the, the account. account. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, is equity drawdown. So the, I need to size. So I, what I will do is I will level it up to a, a, a minimum. And how much sizing so like let's say i'll bring it up up to like five percent so i'll bring it to five percent at the worst i say up but yeah actually yeah up up to five percent and yeah. then I'll, I'll size to what five percent max drawdown is and that's kind of what i do so all my strategies are sized on the same max drawdown like they they are not allowed to pass that and i give them equally as, as much size and then what they do is they do each of them also manage their sizing slightly on individual trades so there's there's a little bit of um, um, code that that tells them what a better condition is versus not, um, and that's that's a big deal. If any guys algo traders, that's like that's that's literally will change your 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 entire portfolio. So there you go. That's like a good tip to write down. Um, but <laughs> like I'm, I'm being dead serious. It's literally changed some of my strategies from like a two like doubled the profits. Um, so that's why I say sizing is so, such a big deal, but I've learned to not compl- complicate it because I've seen some statisticians and some professional algos really struggle to like what sizing looks like for them. And I learned that you should keep it, rel- don't think like a normal trader will, like a discretional trader will when they are looking for a good trade to size up on. You can't size based off your equity. That's another thing too. Do not size based off how good you're doing. <laughs> it's what well, you because you because you have to size based off the market. If you size off your your own performance, you're putting yourself you're setting yourself up for like a failure because your equity does not determine your performance when the market is bad, right? Um, so you're trying to basically be a portion of the volume, a certain percentage of the volume on a stock or a move or a setup or something. As opposed, yeah, to- I mean, I think for me it's it's I size based off, I size based off, um, yeah, like all condition conditioning, but I don't, I don't really care about, I don't care about how much portion of a volume I am actually. I, mm. um, mm. depends. I'm not taking, I'm not taking 10,000 shares. And if I was to some of these stocks that I'm trading, 10,000 shares wouldn't do anything to them. 20,000, 50,000, maybe two cents slippage, <laughs> maybe, but like, um, cause you know, you're trading large caps, right? Primarily. Yeah. Large caps are, and the reason why I trade large caps is just easier to back test. Right. But we are looking into like figuring out, you know, how to do small cap stuff. Um, so like situations like today, 
Um, I what I would do is I would isolate that situation from a bunch like ten thousand, uh, not ten thousand. Um, let's say I, I find like five hundred small cap low floats. So over the history of the like last ten years, what I would do is I would isolate that period, and I'll just do a bunch of tests on it to figure out what will work best. And then now, like you know, Tommy has asked this question before. He was like, I think it was one of the podcasts. He was like, um, if it would be cool if we could just know what the the top is for most of these stocks. Like, what did they just go 150 percent, and then you should stop trading them, and that's when you. It's like, yeah, I could do that. I could actually figure out what the what the top is and just stop trading um, trading that. And how much you know? What's the maximum volume that these? How much dollar amount do they trade over a certain period of time? That that's more of the research side of things. So my my most of my time is like just research. Like that's that's the cool thing about it is that I don't really. You know, I make money. I'll make money no matter what, really. Um, so really, it's just how much more research do I put into improving the idea? Because it's really how much can you improve the idea so that the strategy works more properly? Because you can have a strategy that just shorts a certain, the you know, certain deviation from a something and probably be profitable because you're sitting on the more profitable side. But what if you in, incorporate like the idea that volume is weaker on that pop? Then you size up more when that pop comes up, like when it when it touches that certain deviation. Now you're big, you're thinking a little bit more like, how can I improve this? Um, but my the, the biggest struggle for me, I would say, is really yeah, just more stra coming up with strategies that are not correlated. That is the biggest thing. It's it's really really hard to keep adding more strategies in one market because the market tends to move together, right? So like. Yeah. Um, you know, large caps all tend to move together, right? So what happens is if I have, you would think, oh, just create a bunch of shorting strategies. Well, what happens is if one strategy is trading um, BABA, by the way, short BABA, the best stock to short, short it out of boredom. <laughs> Go look at the chart. It's just, if you're just curious, if you want to just make a bunch of money for no reason, short BABA. But... <laughs> Uh, if you watch stock shorting Baba and one short stock uh stock shorting Disney, which my my thing actually did both today, one of both of those. But like those, that's fine because both of those stocks are very uncorrelated. They are very uncorrelated in how they move. But if I short if I short Baba, Apple, Nvidia, blah blah, like what happens is that I'm literally just correlating um all of my shorts because all of those things move together. So I'm just increasing my risk. I'm just literally each one trade is the same as each, any trade on all of those are the same. They're the same trade because they are going to move together. So the idea for me is how do I come up with more strategies that are do not move together? And then also how many stocks can I put in that group that are uncorrelated? Because I, I told you this before one, each of my strategies trade at least, at least three things that are not correlated. So I'll give you an example, like Apple, XOM, Pfizer, healthcare, energy, tech. It's very uncorrelated. I've done, I've done, you know, I've done a lot of back tests on their daily time frame, on their their hourly time frame to see that they're very, they're relatively uncorrelated. If I trade one strategy on all three of those, those strategies will tend to balance out each other, and that will give me at worst, you know. A, a a ranging equity chart or you know small dip so so the I, the biggest the biggest issue for me is like well how can i keep doing this if the markets all move together well the good question for that the, the way to fix that is to go to a different market you need to start trading futures you need to start trading forex you need to start trading a different asset class that doesn't move the same or start trading small caps small caps are very uncorrelated to the the overall you know large cap market so for us right now what we're like after i'm done with these two strategies that i'm kind of working on i'm kind of i we're, we're already thinking about going to small caps because it's like uh, there's there's a lot of money to be made in small caps it's less capital intensive you know um, yeah that's nice that part it's just lot. yeah it's just hard to the problem is just i i'm just kind of not ready i don't want to code for that because I know, I know a lot of my research for that would be I have to get a bunch of stocks. Because not, you know, no one stock moves. Yeah, I was about to say you can't backtest a stock because because you, you really more you backtest a strategy with a thousand different stocks and each yeah, stock on had idea, their one yeah. day to shine, right? <laughs> or maybe yeah. three days a year. 
It's a little which is what you guys do, which is technically what you guys do every single day, right? Your yeah. scan. So, and that's what we, me and my brother, have been trying to figure out. So, like, we we've, we've been focusing on strategies that really test through one full stock or multiple stocks. I mean, don't get me wrong, our strategies work on multiple stocks. It's just I just have to pick the ones that are the best mm. because because they are all correlated. So I have to pick three or four or as many uncorrelated groups as I can in one strategy, right? Um, so, and I'm, I'm sure if any algo tr trader is listening to this, you know, I'm sure you do the same, or if you do something else, let me know. Um, but the, the, the biggest issue for us now is with this small cap is, let's say um, Tommy has a scan that tells him trade, you know, um, Carvana or whatever. I don't know if Carvana is the last cap. I don't know what small cap. I, I completely forgot all small caps, which is so sad. <laughs> I, I forget the tickers by, by within a couple of hours, so no worries. Yeah, by the end of the day, I have no idea what happened. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but um, let's say he, he was trading that. He can also have a scan that tells him another thing is, is you know trading really well. That But there are different stocks. There are a bunch of data I have to get through, I have to see through. But the cool thing about it is once you found one good thing that works, whether it's on the hourly time frame, I don't trade really anything lower than the five minute. It's just too noisy. <laughs> data just comes out shitty. Um, it's you, it's tradable, but also I would the infrastructure to trade that is actually very like it, it would be a lot to to trade that because the the processing power that it would take for me to back test on one minute time frames would be a lot. So maybe down the road, like five years from now. But um, yeah, I hopefully, can see that. Yeah, hopefully in the next um. In the next couple months, we'll start doing some small cap strategies. And if I do, I'll let you guys know. I'll let you know if there's any big thing that I've learned that you guys should not be doing. But who knows? <laughs> you guys, I've seen small cap traders do the most impossible things and still make money. I, I truly believe everything works. It's just yeah, how you're applying it. That's right? one thing I've learned too, right? It's like everyone here even trades so differently, but it works for all of us. So it's you got to find what works for you. And with discretionary trading, your personality is such a big component. Um, yeah. I think one thing I would I would always say with, with discretional trading, like if I was like, let's say I, I took Tommy's stats, right? What I would do is I would just I would just take your stats and break it down as much as possible to try to improve. Like, and you can't do it, but I would say like, let's say I know all the stocks that you traded over a period of time. And I know how long you traded. I could probably analyze the stock and see how you reacted to the stock and then tell you what you were doing wrong or how you have improved. And one big thing I was going to, which was about sizing, like, uh, uh, which I was, I was curious if you guys would say the same thing, but I would size based off um, um, if I've doubled my drawdown. Like, let's say your last drawdown over the last three, um, six to 12 months was 5% of your equity, right? If you get to 10% of your equity, now you can start doubling your size because if you lose, you're just going to lose the money that you've made, right? And then, and you can also be confident that you're you're not going to really risk that drawdown again, you know, because your performance is that good. So you can kind of keep, it's to keep your confidence strong, you can just base it off your last max drawdown relative to, you know, percentage of your equity. So like, if, if that, I don't know if that makes sense. So yeah. if if I draw down ten percent, technically I should be sizing even more aggressively, is what you're no, saying. No, no, no. I'm saying like, um, how do you base on when you size up overall? Like when you become that trader that's doing like three thousand. Oh, 4, 000, I heard 000. the somehow I heard the reverse. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm like, saying like, if you know your equity, if you know like in the last six months the maximum drawdown you were ever at was six percent, right? Right. If you ever make 12%, now size up, double it. Because the most you would you would draw down again is that 6%. Because you know performance-wise that you are 6% drawdown performer no matter what over six months. Now, is six months enough time? I don't know, you know, but I would think it is because you guys trade every single day and don't really know yourself. Um, my strategy is I have five years and I know what my max drawdown is for each one. If they ever break it, the strategy gets turned off. Luck luckily, none of them have ever, you know, well, we had one that touched it, but it didn't even go live yet. Um, but so like, that's a good way to kind of feel like, hey, it's time for me to start doubling my size because anything I risk now is just profit and I need to become a better trader. Now you don't have to double your size. You could like, you know, 1.5 or whatever. But I think overall you need to increase your your general sizing because if not, when are you ever going to become that million dollar trader? 
you're gonna if you're if you're yeah. constantly if you're constantly wishy washy on going back and which I've seen, like I said, I've I've seen this in that that two months I lost of my life. I saw what happens. You 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 never really get to that plat uh, break that plateau in a significant way. So you yeah. have to kind of do make size um definite judgments of like okay this is when i'm going to start this is if i if i six pack six percent was my max drawdown i've doubled it all right time for me to just size up 1.5 and everything and that is it from now on to whatever i know my confidence level is still going to be strong until i mix that reach that six percent drawdown again and if i do now i can say whoa okay let me size down again because something has definitely happened to me the market or my confidence level because if you're constantly basing your confidence level how you feel every single day which is fine which is perfect as a as a discretionary trader you still don't you still don't get some some measure of of growth which like is like that you make it yeah, a, as so, objective as possible using an equity curve or something like that or yeah uh, and you have that on, on on trade um trade journal i think i've seen like your equity um i've seen your alex's equity curve and i think i've seen tommy's too like you can probably see what your max drawdown is. I think TraderView does that too. Yeah, TraderView uh, like, does yeah. as well. We don't have yeah, like a specific but... max drawdown. You would have to just kind of calculate it from the equity curve. Like if you're no, 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 no. TraderView actually shows your drawdown. Like yeah, they really... they have a really nice one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll probably incorporate so if, something like that soon. So if you can see that, you can keep that as that. And what you would do, what I would yeah. do is I would shift that drawdown because who knows your six percent drawdown might not be your drawdown forever like you want to shift it as as well as like for example every year 12 months you shift it now this 12 months what was my max drawdown here what was my max drawdown here that way you can keep track of your drawdown and and figure out how to grow from from that i think yeah. that's the best way i i never thought about it until i started doing algo trading but really it's probably one of the best best ways to think about sizing now like i said sizing is in itself is a very it's a very debilitating. It can be a very debilitating thing to your to your equity. Um, <laughs> I've just so you really have to be you know you just have to make a decision on what you're going to do and do it. And making I'll try to keep it as objective as possible is probably one of the best ways. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if anyone had any more questions about that, but I'll tell you what. Like I feel like if you're if you're a trader and you're profitable, it's 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 costly not sizing also there's like a huge opportunity yeah. cost every day yeah. you know and uh, if you're not using big size then it's kind of like what are you doing you're wasting your time then you're better off doing something else uh, but first you do have to show that you're profitable um but yeah once you are profitable like i feel like sometimes i'm sizing way too little i'm feeling kind of ridiculous about it you know if it is august i you know that can be an excuse but i also don't like making excuses i still feel like i should be sizing more but mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, it's a huge opportunity cost. Like if I make, you know, $300 today, I, you know, I probably could have made $1,200 just using bigger size. And sometimes it's not even a lot of size you're missing. You just, you were a little scared that day or something. Yeah. Well, I think also it's, it, you have to, you really do have to have like a clear defined idea of what sizing looks like for that at the moment of, 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 at this trader that you are at that point. And yeah. I, I like your approach. I don't know what that. Danny, I don't know what Danny's typical size is. Um, like Danny, Danny, what are you sizing right now? Like most of your like life? two to four thousand ish on most trades. Like so one like, to four thousand on pretty much all trades. Are you talking about shares? Yeah, shares. Shares. Okay, so like that, like obviously you, you. I don't know if you were sizing it with that when you started, but at some point you were probably sizing it very a lot less. But yeah. you know, as you become a more confident trader. You do have to have like clear ideas of what 2,000, 4,000 looks like as a consistent on a consistent basis. Yeah, maybe one day you yeah. see a stock going a thousand percent and you don't want to size in 2,000. Or maybe that's your best winning day, your best win, winning day. Uh, but you can, you can size on less than that. But I think it's, it is good to have a clear idea because I've seen that with our, a lot of our strategies. And the reason I say strategies here is this is where all the code is. But like, um, I see a lot of the strategies. I see what happens when you play with sizing. It really can change. It can change your entire strategy. I, I actually put it on one of our mm -hmm. strategies that stopped working, and it, it made the strategy work because it just sized in when it was when it was when it needed to size in when it was better, and it changed the entire structure of the strategy. <laughs>
Yeah, that's crazy. For for algo trading, when you say you change the size, like for some reason, I just picture every time it takes a trade, it uses like the defined X amount of shares or something. So when no, you talk no. about, yeah, how does how does that work with algo trading? Because I, I no, can't I size picture. in I size in based on equity. So okay, so it's a percentage <laughs> of equity. Yeah, you have to size in based off a percentage of equity. I think right now we don't size in more than um, what is it? Uh. 2% is the max, but I just reduced everything to 1.5 because I added another strategy and that's going to be, it, it improved the overall combined portfolio. So I don't need to size in as much. And what, what has happened is when you, it's better to size in when you have a new, it's better to, okay, so let's say you have, you're taking 1% risk every single time. Well, would you rather double your risk or just come up with a new strategy? The idea is, the idea is come up with a new strategy because then you technically double your risk for less correlation. Because now mm. you have two strategies, but they're not correlated, but you're still taking one to one risk. Then you probably will be trading as frequent, more frequently because you have a new strategy. So yeah, for us, for, for me, what I do is I, 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 I will try to bring down the risk if I'm introducing a new strategy because I don't need to risk as much on each trade anymore. And also it's very capital intensive. When I bring in a new strategy, if money is in one trade, it might not be enough for another trade. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. So so I guess what, what I'm just trying to say is that I size based off equity, but I try to reduce how much I'm sizing if I have a lot of strategies because each yeah. strategy is going to be a new, a new bulk of equity associated with that strategy when it's on, when it takes a trade. If that makes sense. Uh, how many How many strategies did you say you have or is that... Right now, seven. I just introduced the new one yesterday, and it did like five. It did like three hundred dollars yesterday, which is really good. So, does that mean the most you can be allocated is like fourteen percent equity, based on like a two percent? Or yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But right now it's one point five. So yeah, but but the thing is that ne each strategy is never going to be turned on at the same time. There's, right. There's yeah, that would be because they're not correlated. There's really no right? way because of the the structure of the idea. It's just not they like one will show at the top, one will buy the bottom. There's no way those will happen unless they are different stocks. And at that point, there's good correlation because then, then they're probably going to balance out each other at some point because they're right. not moving. There's no inherent reason they're moving together, and they're still taking the better probable trade. That makes sense. That makes sense. I I totally agree with the point about sizing up. Um, I've seen at least a couple traders come and go. And just fail in the market because they were not able to size up even when market condi conditions were good. And so when market conditions were flat or bad, then they're just taking much more losses. And in those good times or even on the best trades that they should be sizing up on, they're not outweighing those losses. So, yeah, it is super important. I, th I think especially as you're seeing any sort of consistency. Yeah. It is really scary. It is it is really lead. scary to do that as a yeah. as a discretionary trader though. I can I can see the I can see the tim the timidness of wanting to size up yeah. and trade because you don't know what a good trade looks like. For me, I can back test and know what a good trade looks like and guarantee that over a period of time it will not guarantee, but at least know generally that it will do better. It is a higher probability. Yeah. Trade. What's, I, what's I, the I likelihood that the back test? is similar to the the live trading <laughs> so that's where you come, that's where you come with robustness testing um so i don't want to give out how i do my robustness testing but we we do really well like we most of our stuff has does walk forward analysis we use walk forward analysis in our overall process of robustness testing um if you if you're an algo trader you know what that means if not what it is is just um like I will test it on, I'll test five years here and then I'll see how it performs on one year, test five years here, see how it performs on this year live, test five years here. And then, and then I'll combine all the lives together to know what it looks like overall, like the live trades look like. So I like having multiple stages. So according to Google, Robustus is basically taking back testing, but for testing on random conditions, theorized random conditions. Is that what you yeah. would kind of describe it? Yeah. If you look up walk forward, walk forward analysis, it will yeah. give you a better, um, it will give you a better uh, image of what I was trying to explain. So if you look at, if you look at the image, go to images, might be able to find. Um, yeah, you could, you could use, oh well, yeah, you could use that one. That video is actually the one I watched, but 
So what he will do is he will optimize over that period and then he'll test it live on that period. So the one in the bottom is the is the right way to do it. The one in the top way is like the way really non if you're not good, you probably do it that way. Which is which is fine. I mean, some some people it works for them that way, but um so you're you know. you're constantly optimizing is what is what you're saying. Yeah, and our program, the program the like I said, the program I do, I'm do i using already does this automatically. How I utilize the program and some of the things that we've done is what makes ours like more proprietary. So it's because we we really, are, you know, I'm, I'm so sure that our stuff is going to perform well over a long period of time. Um, and at least a year, at least a year uh, based off our work for a test. And I have an, another way I... I'm sure of that is because I have multiple stocks with each thing trading. So if one stock starts to fail really badly with the strategy, other stocks can't, other stocks still have a chance of making it up. So that's why each strategy technically doesn't really lose money. Like none of our strategies right now have are even negative. They're all like up at least 1%. That's so beautiful. Like, <laughs> well, I told you we have one that is literally just made money every single month. I, I wish the equity chart looks ridiculous. I, 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 I told my brother, I was like, this is not possible. Like, why is this happening? Would and it I, make I, sense to increase the percent that one uses in, equ- in no, terms of position? No, no, that's what I've tried that. Ah. What happens is that what happens is that if it fails, it it destroys the portfolio. You know, the whole so, portfolio. So you want to have every strategy the same allocation. It's so interesting, yeah, it, even if one I, is better. I haven't figured out. Maybe you know some of these Goldman Sachs um, quants could could message me or something. Let me know if I, there's something I'm missing out. Um, but I haven't, I, I don't think, and I'm telling you because I've seen like even Kevin Davey, uh, who is an algo person on YouTube, if you watch him, um, or some other algo people on, on, on YouTube, they, you know, it's very hard to figure out when to size up um, on individual strategies. Um, you like you should just leave them issue. all the same. Um, but, but yeah, sizing is definitely is definitely a big one. It's, it's just something I've I've decided. Look, I lost two months of my life with it, and it was really I I, I was getting depressed. Which is I was like, I it's know I have to figure two it out. Months. It's easy for you, <laughs> and I was still making it's money. That was actually the month where that was the month I made the most money, yeah. and I was so I was sad because I was pre- I was trying to figure out this this stupid thing. What yeah. is uh? I might have yeah. missed it, but what is the program that you use called? <laughs> Amy bro, I mean Amy bro. So I'll, I'll pull it up here. I had it. I was gonna bring that up actually. So it's A-M-I. Hey, I need an affiliate link if people start using this. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, Alex, yeah. I, Alex, you know why? You know why? But I will not be getting an affiliate link from the creator. <laughs> yeah, and it's different. um, it's an actual broker. You put your money in it. No, so it's just a way to code. Um, it's just a platform. It almost feels like DOS Trader. Code. Like you have this. Yeah platform that you pay for and it connects yeah. to the broker well i think you just pay it's very cheap the guy made it really cheap it's like 500 bucks yeah um, it's actually pretty affordable because it's yeah it's very affordable design, right? so it's no 24 people, the 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 hard part is getting setting up the infrastructure for actually taking the trades and everything but if you just want to back test an idea you can do it um you would you might be you might find that you're better than it because there's there's some quirks with it um a lot of quirks with it but I will say, you know, in anything, if you were going to do this on Python, if you're going to do this on MetaTrader, you will have your issues. It really becomes, you need to be three things. You need to be a good research analyst. You need to be a good developer and then a decent risk manager. Like if you cannot be all three of those things actively, it's going to be a lot, but it does cost a lot of time to do it. But I will say it's worth it because I, I you know, I've t- I talked to, Alex about this early, like when we first met, like the lack of headache that I've gotten from doing this versus trading every day was very significant. Like I used to stress, like even my girl, she's like, like I used to stress day, every other day, like, oh, like, like you remember you said that you used to lay on the floor with your girlfriend. When you I was just to about to me. say, wait, you don't <laughs> miss walking into the living room, laying on the floor. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> no, I had a, I had a huge loss one day. And I was like curling up like a like an yes, animal that just got hit <laughs> badly, and oh. um, I I don't even have those days. Like literally, we will lose a thousand bucks over two days, and I was just like, oh well, 
Right, yeah, so I guess it's different if the algo does it, and then you can also code on your own schedule. I think that's pretty nice. Like we're we're pretty tied to the market, especially when we're traveling. It makes it a little bit tricky. You can't just work in the morning and be done and then enjoy my day. I could on the East Coast, but I can't, you know, AP. in yeah. Europe or in, you know, yeah. if I go to Asia or something like that. So it's definitely a problem. You know, for sure, when you're taking those thousand dollar losses or whatever at that point that <laughs> it the just the probability makes sense like it's yeah not the probability your makes sense and it's, it's i've never reached our, ma our max drawdown on our on our uh, overall yes. portfolio i think it's 13 percent, which i need to increase to like 20 at some point honestly the only reason i have it is because we don't have enough money in my account for me to be taking trades but i have i have a few ways of getting more money in my account right now but you know i told alex i'm helping pay my brother's school and stuff like that so that's like draining my bank my savings so yeah. i don't want to just throw money into my my account but at some point, you know, like I said, another big thing about algo trading is that once you're doing it, everyone wants to give you money yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you realize that you can give them, you know, 120% on their returns every single year. And they don't have to think about it or care about it. And I think people trust an algorithm more than they trust a person. Like if you can show sure. here, here's five years of back testing and two years of profit. And I can give you reports every week. I can show yeah. you what it looks like. It's not really... And it I, honestly, capital. honestly, opening a fund, getting like a couple million assets under management, or maybe, you know, tens of millions and charging, you know, your 222 and 20, you know, 2% uh, asset, assets under management, 20% uh, performance, like the classic, I mean, it's reduced now, it's like, one to 10. Uh, hedge funds have yeah. reduced the fees because they were so outrageous for so for, for so long. But that might be a really good way to make kind of stupid money i'm not really sure you need a bit of a network but it seems like you have a pretty big no, i do ready i do have i can't i can't create that um definitely but you know being international there's a lot of legal stuff for me that i can't how i can't can or cannot make money there's a lot of legal stuff i looked into it for a while anywhere. it's it's not impossible. I mean, if you're ever interested, let me know um, because I could probably help out. I was really close to starting a hedge fund like three, four years ago. And I have a friend with a hedge fund that helped me set up all the legal framework already. So yeah, no, a quant, quant funds, quant funds are really trusted and they do. Uh, I mean, if you look at Renaissance technology, uh, the, uh, the, um, yeah, the classic, the medallion, medallion fund, if you look that up, like, I can't remember. It says if you, like, if you, <laughs> if you invested like three bucks, in 19 whatever it would have you would be up like a couple million um yeah. now because they do like 20 percent annually every year and that's that's you know it's funny because people think that that's little but you have to understand right like 20 or 40 50 even 60 i think they've had years where they do 60 percent. but to yeah. do that on an equity to do that on an equity that's billions is ridiculous like yeah. compounded annual rate of i mean it's, between it's eight honestly and because liquidity will kill you uh, yeah. most of the time when you size up so when you're dealing you with make, that much money yeah you can make 200 percent, 300 percent using an algo i think the the algo competition in like 20 2020 a guy did like nine nine thousand percent but like if you're okay. doing that with if you're doing that with 52 billion in assets and i don't know what the medallion yeah. actually has it's probably like two or three billion to be moving shares that you know share size in, in multiple countries and dealing with all the fees and doing 20 60 percent is actually really really good yeah, it's insane. The fees were insane. insane that they were yeah. charging. Um, here's a question, and there might be a good one to consider wrapping up on, but we'll see. Um, what if if somebody was interested in becoming an algo trader? Like, where would they start? Could they follow you? Would they follow somebody else? <laughs> Is it just say, Reddit? Yeah. <laughs> like, what what do you do? Um. Okay. Honestly, it's tough. Right. It's tough only because there's a lot of secrecy on an algo trading. Right. Yeah. I, I probably said so much that if an algo trader is actively watching this, they probably are gonna be like, I need to take notes because he probably most of what I said just now, go back and go back and look into your code and try to figure out how to implement the ideas at least. Um it's tough, especially because there are different ways. You, you can be an algo trader on different levels, right? You can be a high frequency algo trader. You can be a, you know, you can date, trade on a larger time frame, like a daily time frame, which I, I, I actually recommend people like you guys do because, you know, you have somewhat of an understanding of the markets and coding that is not that hard. If you look at, um, I, I can send you critical trading's strategy that he runs on, um, 
on Spy. Um, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, it's like the the one with like only three three rules. Uh, I can't pull it. Okay, I can't find and it. I'll, where I'll where is he running that? It's just on algo on. He does it on Ami Broker, and he does it on a daily time frame. And oh, all he does him. is that whenever whenever the I think it's whenever the candle closes under the the low, it will you buy, and then if it goes over the top, you sell. And it's like the same thing I told you, where literally you can there are algo strategies where if you buy on Monday and sell on Friday, you will perform better than the spy over the last 15, 20 years. Like there's literally and and it sounds it sounds very complex, but it sounds complex to say algo trading, but no, that's like what you could do. The only difference is now now you can clearly back test that idea and know you'll be profitable without even stress. Right? right now you're trading, and that that could actually simplify your trading because now you're just trading for fun. Well, you're trading for for fun, but you're trading just to to get extra money on top of everything. So if as far as where to start, there's you know, I mean, broker. I I would say, somewhat, um, can be technical because you're starting it from your for yourself. Like you, you're you're doing everything yourself and a little bit of the infrastructure. Ninja Trader, I've heard, is good. Um, I've seen that because it connects directly to your broker. You do pay fees, like some fees for it or whatever. Um, I don't know exactly what, but there's a guy on there's a guy on YouTube actually. I can send you his YouTube after this. But he he's literally been doing twenty percent every single month for the last like since Jan like about ten to twenty percent every single month since January. He's he's his account is like was at five hundred k to begin with. I can only imagine where he is now. He's probably made like a quarter million just off his algo, um, which is just interesting. But I'm I think Ninja Trader Ninja Trader is a good one probably to start with because they just have the connection to your broker and everything. Can you do as much intricate stuff? I don't know because I do a lot of crazy, a lot of crazy shit on mine. But I also think I'm, you know, I'm more of a coder. I can, I know me and my brother will, will try doing some, some break this, we'll break the program just to make sure it works how we want it to. Um, so that's a little bit different. But if you're a beginner, yeah, definitely like a ninja trader. As far as, as study material, um, if you look up Darwin X, Darwin X on YouTube, Actually, I want to show you guys. Actually, maybe, maybe um, Alex, you can show the if you go on the website you can on share. Darwin X or on yeah, Darwin X. If you Google Darwin X Explore, oh, I just ended up on a really weird YouTube channel. Definitely not the right one. <laughs> uh, so I didn't want to share. I'll, I'll, write, it, I'll write it in the chat. Uh, Darwin X, like that. that <laughs> that's funny. Okay. Okay. You're like that's not that's that's, that's survival <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, that can't be it. Yeah, uh, oh, took the wrong turn. Uh, okay, yeah, this is this looks more like it would be it. Yeah, if you look up, go to Google and look up Darwin X Explore because I don't know how to get from that to the Explore from here. Honestly, I've tried uh, Darwin X Explore. Explore. Yeah. So this is a this is a uh, I guess you could call it copy trading, but what they it's not really copy trading because they manage your funds with the strategy. But what they do is that you can actually just put your money in any of these strategies. So if you don't even want to be an algo trader and you just have money sitting around, you can just give them your money and they'll put it in these strategies, um, and they it will trade with the strategy. And there's a lot of information you can see in the strategies, stuff that you know I might need to help you break down to understand what why they have that all that information. But like, if you look down, if you go down, this is just the essential. But if you go to that, if you go to Da, T-H-A, that person, if you just click uh, to the left, yeah, right there. That person has been on here for like the last five years and his performance, if you scroll down, he's he's done about 800%. This is, look at his equity chart. It's ridiculous. And all of this is verified. Everything is like, whatever. Um, Very interesting site. You can just put, you could just buy one of their strategies or put money into one of the strategies and and you can take it out whenever. I don't and know if what now, what's, are they charging? Really, what's the uh, incentive for them? They're charging for so, something. So you, I think they they take a fee. the The people who give their strategies take a fee. Um, you can't see the strategy code or anything. Um, you just you're just essentially just copy trading. But right. Uh, but Darwin X manages your risk and everything. They have a six percent risk that they minimize you to like i can't remember i i, I used to focus on them a lot because i thought i'll be on there but honestly there are better traders who are not on here these this is just good that people some people are still on here and you can use them 
you know, if you want to just diversify to an algo type of strategies. Uh, but this guy has a really good strategy. If you if you look up, you can actually see the information about the strategy. I think if you go on, the, yeah, right there, he says global macro strategy focused on economic releases. So he he trades forex and he focuses. I, I he might have like an API that he's using to to keep up with the economic releases and buying off of those, um, which is interesting in itself. Hard to back test, but it works. But he's been doing he's been doing really good, and there are a lot of other there are a lot of other strategies like these that you can kind of keep up with. Don't get me wrong; some of them fail. I've seen some of them fail, but some of but you can see the ones that have the longer track record over like three or five years. So gotcha. if you don't want to develop something, this is an option to pick on. Um, and Darwin X is pretty safe, yeah, but yeah, in the UK, Americans can do it though. So um, if you're American, I'm sorry, no. Uh, Unbelievable. Yeah, Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i'm but don't get me wrong yeah they're definitely american alternatives i don't know if they are as i don't yeah, know it's if a they good are, start it's a good place to start research and then you know start doing some googling and yeah and their youtube their youtube actually teaches you a lot of the algo trading stuff so they have like uh 100 videos 100 plus videos because they want to incentivize more algo traders to join their platform so they actually teach a lot of trivial stuff um, so if you ever want to learn using MetaTrader or NinjaTrader, they actually teach you some of it. Um, and like the idea of like robustness testing and stuff like that. The guy who teaches it is a little bit, uh, he, I, I have some criticisms about him now that I've, I've gotten good at this. I started to notice, okay, he's not necessarily the best, but, um, but you can always, you, it's, it's enough for you to learn, like, a lot of information and be like oh okay now i understand what i'm doing i will say though coming up with a day a trading strategy that trades on a daily time frame and buys and sells and performs better than the spy it's not that hard um no. and if you just if you want to take the trade manually or uh if you want to take the trade manually and just back test the idea you can use something like ami broker like you can just back test the idea and take the trade manually yourself and then just be like okay it's reached my entry. I'm just going to take it manually. And you can still perform as long as you stick to those rules uh, that you develop for yourself. Dang, there's so much to think about. Um, definitely have to work <laughs> yes. that out. I, would, I wouldn't mind playing around with it just for fun, just to, like you said, like a long strategy, just to just kind of understand it a little bit more, see what I can learn from it. Anyone? That, that would be a good idea for uh, Colby since he was having trouble with the indexes that's, uh, that's why I that, brought could it be, up. that could be a better path <laughs> for him since it's you know more automated and he can focus on his um little side business that he's got going as well um and it keeps him you know accountable with entries and exits um yeah so that's that could be helpful I, I agree and i think i think honestly you, what you guys are doing what you guys are doing is really good already um like you guys are performing really well in a in a high frequency environment and you're doing well, it's sometimes I think at, at your level is more, how can I improve my statistics based off my statistics? Yeah. So you might not even need to find an alternative that can do some trading for you and you enjoy what you're doing. <clears throat> I will say there's, there is, you know, once you're like, I don't know how old you get to, but once you reach a certain level, I do feel like there's a point of like, okay, I have this much money. Let me just put it into a dividend, dividend fund. Or like Mars yeah. where you, you don't want to lose like 2 million and just be like, why? Like, you know, you and then be like, well, oh, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's traumatizing. <clears throat> yeah. Anyone have any questions for Lawrence before we wrap up here? Yeah, like a million. I'd be <laughs> yeah. really interested <laughs> yeah. to well, keep talking I think about we'll, it. And... We'll probably have you come on, if, if, you know, whenever you're available again. Uh, and we could, you know, you're in the group in the Discord. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you could throw it to Lawrence in the Discord as well. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's like an unlimited amount of things I feel like we could talk about. So uh, definitely a good starting point for everyone to at least get to know who you are, uh, and for us to get to, you know, all learn each other. And then, uh, I'm, I'm sure the questions will come flooding in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you see, that's, that's a little bit of why I, I kind of kept to myself is also because I realized <laughs> so, I, I was talking to my girl about this. I was like, I, I because we were, she was like, Oh, you could teach people how to do this. I was like, Nah, I've gotten too far. I'm too far in already. This is not. This is not <laughs> like a, oh, let me just sell you a ten dollar course or a two hundred dollar course. This is like a. Now nah, we have to go to school together for a little bit. <laughs> and <laughs> it it seems basically just 
the same kind of difficulty as actually learning how to be profitable day trading. Probably, yeah. But but the but the difference confidence level. I, yeah. I completely agree. I actually thought about that too. It's in, in terms thinking, of learning like, and difficulty. I, I yes, would think in terms I'm of investment. learning and difficulties. But imagine there's so many times where you you really I, I felt this because I was trading. There were so many times I felt like okay, I know what I'm doing, I know everything I'm doing. Why why do I keep sabotaging myself sometimes? Right? Yeah, and you well, question like, everything. Yeah. yeah. But, but now it's like now I'm like, you know, after the first two months and I saw the algos working properly, I was just like so calm. I'm like, you know, I don't even whenever whenever we're in a trade, I could be in a train and something I see I'm in a trade. I'm like, okay, I lose 400 bucks. I'm like, okay. I don't really think, oh, Ah, you know, that type of feeling. And I, I will say that confidence level, I think, is what makes you a, a I, I don't know, it's it's not like proven, but you're like a sure, you're for sure a trader at that point, because you don't have a sense of like, I could, something in my life could warrant me messing this all up. The only reason, the only issue that I always, we have is like maybe, you know, um, margin requirements. And stuff like that um but you know we don't hold anything overnight and we have a bunch of um and no leverage fail safes we have a bunch of fail safes to cut any trade that are held over a certain period of time um mm -hmm. and and you know we for example we were trapped in a t1 earnings a t1 halt and i was like what hap what is the algo going to do here because it's never been in a t and next candle open is sold because it had already reached the period it sold when it opened up and that was just a good confidence way of like oh nice everything is working yeah smooth. that is uh, nice that you're always tweaking and improving and it's definitely different well i mean technically we're always tweaking and improving same, yeah, yeah. i mean same. sometimes you just have an off week or you make you know human errors so it's a little bit different uh, yeah. don't worry i I'm, i've made human errors before i've i've i was I, testing uh, i was testing a trade on i was testing a strat uh, uh execution on a on a stock and I didn't know my my Python file to take the trade in to take the trade was on, and it um it actually triggered a trade on Johnson and Johnson pre market with three hundred shares. I'm just telling you that's seventy grand, right? I moved the stock 05 percent on a day, and and I was <laughs> like, and if I if 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 it opened up, I would have if it opened up a lot higher, I could have lost. I, I think I lost three hundred bucks, but. If, it, if something happened, if they had news, could have could have lost like two, three grand, like off of just that is, is, issue. Um, yeah. But that's I but that was just me right, being yeah. being dumb. But it it actually it actually gave me an idea for a strategy, uh, which was um, like for example, let's say, uh, okay, caveat, this strategy might sound like manipulation, but everything we do is technically manipulation. <laughs> we to yeah. some extent but um it totally is i agree yeah the idea was that what if i was what if i was shorting johnson and johnson a couple of days before on a bigger strategy and right the day before the strategy closed so like let's say i had a two million dollar position on johnson and johnson pre-market like i'm sorry a couple of days ago like five days ago right like five days ago i had a position here that was shorting stock comes down here right now all i have to do pre-market the day before it opens or you know is just short it with that 70 grand which doesn't really do anything to how much money i'm losing because that's a different position it's a different idea but it gives this position here 5.5 percent profit right and by the time it opens i just close everything so mm. that little bit of loss that i did on that position pre-market would have caused that bigger position that i had up here to make to make more money and overall, I would have made more money. Now you can only do that pre-market because you can move the stock down a little bit more and then cover your position. But um, it was just an interesting idea. And, and immediately I thought about it. I said, someone else is doing this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, people are doing this all the time because there's no way I just thought about an idea from an accident and someone else yeah. be like, oh, I have a new way for us to make more money. You were, you were the first person to think of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, Pro Probably not. There's literally yeah. an unlimited amount of strategies you could probably come up with. I mean, yeah. asset classes, earnings, all sorts of stuff, mean reversion or Monte Carlo. Like it's, it's like so many different philosophies. It's endless. Yeah. Great. Dang, crazy. All right. Well, you got to wrap up though before it goes too yeah. long. Uh, Lawrence, mm -hmm. 
I'm going to put your information below the video, but where's the best place somebody could reach you? Um, I mean, you well, okay. So Instagram is the best place probably I, but I will, I will say, I don't check my, I don't check my socials as much anymore. So I had, I had over half a million followers. I still have over half a million followers across all my stuff. Um, I, but I kind of took a break from social media, but if you, yeah, if you DM me and it's interesting enough, like if it's if it's, or, if or it's join the discord, I, I'll um, put yeah, your information. Discord, discord is fine. I, yeah. I actually like, I, I'm fine with discord. I think discord is fine, but I'm, I'm worried that people are going to be like, DM me. Okay. Wait, what is the new, how do you, how do I create this? Album? Please just tell me. I'm like, I'm like, no, this is, this was a hard thing for me to figure out. There's enough resources out there, but if there's like individual questions, I don't mind answering. Like especially, especially in the beginning, because I know, I know a lot of people could struggle with like, am I doing it right? Because I, I struggled a lot of the times with, am I doing it right? Because there's, there's really no mentor on the algo space, especially if you, especially how, how deep you can go into it. There's no one telling yeah. you how to do high frequency. I believe uh, even with the yeah. trading, you know, if you follow someone like Ross or you follow Tim Sykes or <clears throat> yeah. anyone, you're just like, am I like is this just all BS or does this even work? Like you just start, you know, like you try for a couple of months, nothing works and you start questioning everything. So yeah. There's, there's a lot of guidance though, at least on just how to day trade and how yeah. to- Yeah, and the live streaming is, is helpful that uh, yeah. Relentless is doing or, or Ross is yeah. doing. And, I used to do and that the thing is that well. you don't see that, you don't see that at all in Algo. Yeah, at all. It's, right. It's nothing, much more secret at all. You never see, you never see anyone's code They'll tell you an idea. They'll give you clips of it, but they will never tell you. Like you never. And I, and it's it's very very frustrating to learn algo trading because no one is telling you if you're doing it right. Because the problem is that it's a guaranteed is a guaranteed edge. If I give you anything, it's like you know for sure that you're not gonna you're not gonna um, unless you know you need, you do need to optimize and stuff like that. But you know now that this is something for you to live off of for the next like couple you know months or whatever as long as it works. And it, I think that's why I get the secrecy. I do hate it because it's impossible for anyone to come in. But I guess that's why, you know, the banks and um, the hedge funds, you know, invest Finance so much. Sector. Where they, that's, that's pretty much their bread and butter for, you know, yeah. consistency. Yeah, we got the best rep of the finance industry. All right, guys. Well, Lawrence, thanks for dropping in. Uh, yeah. We hope to see you again on here. Uh, everyone else, I guess, uh, see you guys in the Discord or see everyone in the Discord. <laughs> good luck trading this let me know yeah if you have any questions be sure to just drop in the discord and uh um i'll be sure and i can show, share you guys some of like what my equity charts and stuff look like so you can yeah like, i was actually gonna ask yeah, you that that'd be, totally of mine. that'd be cool yeah yeah I'll, I'll send i'll show you some images of like some of the strategies and i'll tell you when it started live and what that looks like and you can see an idea of oh okay this is how it's performing I'll get yeah, you to yeah. import it on Trade Journal. <laughs> That'd be really interesting to see. Yep. <clears throat> All right. All right, everyone. All right. Take, take Thank it you easy, guys. guys. Uh, it's nice Thanks, to meet guys. you, Lawrence. Yeah, it was nice meeting you, yeah, Lawrence. It was good to, to actually talk to you versus in the comments. I listen to you guys in uh, what I'm what I'm coding, so that's why I, I keep you guys in the background, and, and I was like, oh, that's nice. interesting. When you say that's so impressive. Like, oh, <laughs> Toby, we'll have to interrogate you next time. You're too quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably doing so many trades. I yeah. thought, yeah, I just thought he was in trades. I was like, no. Nah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, All right, right, guys. Have a good one. All guys. right. Take it easy.